Hi there folks, I'm Cody Rodemaker. I am the curator here at the Holocaust Museum and Cohen Education Center here in Naples, Florida. We are continuing our series on our temporary exhibit, Through Their Eyes, The Liberation of Concentration Camps. This is actually the final video, so please do take a look at the other ones if you have not already. But we're covering a couple little uh, side sections that you might not necessarily see, plus our final uh, section that has cases in it. Now some of this material is going to be a little graphic, so if you aren't comfortable with that, uh, please do keep that in mind. And when you do visit, there is a side of the temporary exhibit gallery that has two exit signs on it. Follow those exit signs and you will not see these items. So first thing we're going to talk about is actually the liberating units of the United States. This is a panel we made because we wanted to show where this information came from. Now in the original uh, liberating units that were talked about were actually in 1985 and from there it developed into a partnership between the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the US Army's Center of Military History. So these two organizations actually worked together to create the criteria that designated whether a division was a liberating division or not. And we're really appreciative that they were so open about sharing this information and providing it to other organizations such as our own. And this is actually very much the basis of how we decide what kind of materials to take in connected to the Army, connected to military. So this is really important to us and we're really appreciative to those two organizations for helping us out. So as you can see here, there's quite a lot of infantry divisions, the 1st through the 104th. And then you have some armored divisions here, the 3rd through the 20th. And then two airborne divisions actually took part as well in various liberations. So we did have talked about those throughout our exhibits, but we've highlighted obviously the ones that we have materials to. So let's talk about the other side of this section. We have two large images on this wall. They are actually images connected to the liberation of a site called Middlebau Dora, or Dora Middlebau, or even Nordhausen. You might have heard those names. This was a forced labor site that was connected to the creation of the V-2 missile. This was the first ballistic missile to actually be utilized and actually successfully used. And actually became the basis for a lot of countries' rocketry programs after the war. So they were using these missiles as a basis, and those missiles were made by forced labor. So that's how bad it was in the Third Reich, that they were doing this highly technical work um, through the through the work of forced laborers, so they just did not have the manpower, and unfortunately a lot of people had to die for that. So as you can see here, this is actually a photo taken by liberator Edgar Hunley. His daughter Hazel Hunley actually provided us these photos, as well as the research that she had done. Uh, help us better have an understanding of the 3rd Armored Division's role in the liberation of Dora Middlebow. As you can see here, you see U.S. soldiers in the background probably trying to figure out what are they going to do, what happened here, and unfortunately in the foreground as you can see just rows upon rows of human remains. Those are all the dead that were found, at least in this section of Dora Middlebow, and unfortunately it does make you wonder what do you do with so many that have passed away? How do you take care of all these victims and their remains? All right, so We've seen how the bodies were found. It leads you to wondering, well, how, what did they do with these bodies? How did they um, take care of the, the remains of these victims? And while that's sort of answered by another collection we have, that uh, is by a gentleman by the name of Stephen Machoff. He donated a series of photos taken by his father-in-law, Leo Eisenstadt, that showed that they used a mass grave. Uh, what is notable actually about this picture in particular is the notes connected to it actually talk about requiring the civilians in the nearby towns who should have known if they did not, they claim they did not, and they actually were required to utilize their home doors as makeshift stretchers to move the remains so they could be interred. Um, and that's sort of mind-boggling, but it also shows the scale and the number of people that uh, had died because of the cruelty of the Nazis. So we are greatly appreciative to Ms. Hunley and Mr. Machoff for providing these collections so we could highlight this distinct uh, 
concentration camp, forced labor site, and what was done at them at these sites by the liberators. So let's take a look at Flossenburg now. So that's going to be our last section that it's cases. So let's go over here. So this is our small section on Flossenburg concentration camp system. This was actually one of the largest concentration camp systems in the Third Reich, had nearly a hundred subcamps connected to it. And this is coming from a camp that was founded in 1938 as a site for quarry work. So sort of like a previous uh, camp we talked about, Mauthausen, it started as a site for forced labor, getting these large stones out of a quarry space for architectural projects most likely. And again, as this camp grew, so did the variety of people being held in these camps. So these, the variety of persecuted groups grew. So eventually you saw political prisoners, Jews, homosexuals, Soviet prisoners of war and more. And one notable person actually to talk about is actually a known resistor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a pastor, who uh, was actually held within the Flossenburg system. And like many other concentration camps, when the Allies got closer and closer, the Third Reich forcibly moved people out of Flossenburg and its subcamps to the point that only 1,500 people were still there by the time the 90th Infantry Division actually arrived. And that's sort of mind-boggling to me, honestly. So let's take a look at what actually is in the cases now. We have two unique collections. So we have, the first thing we have here is actually from a local military man as well as a former board member, former Helter. He was kind enough to support the early actions of the Golden Gate Middle School students that we developed from. They created an exhibit called Out of the Ashes and we actually developed from that exhibit. And one of the items we had is actually this small wooden box. And looking at the carving, it does say Flossenburg on there, 1945. What we can't tell though is if it was made before or after liberation, but based upon the materials provided by Mr. Helter, we wanted to highlight it in the Flossenburg section. So we're really appreciative to him and his family for donating these materials. The next section we actually have is from Robert Spitzer, who actually helped liberate a subcamp. He was part of the 9th Armored Division, which uh, liberated Zlodau and Falkenau on der Eger. Now, what's interesting about his materials is they actually highlight Buchenwald, of all places. So we have a liberator from another camp, or two subcamps, I should say, who had images and commentary about Buchenwald itself. We found that very strange, but also very interesting. So we want to show that this kind of information was being shared amongst divisions within the army uh, during their service. We also want to highlight also this uh, unique stamping on the back. This is actually saying that these items were actually past army examination. So what happened most likely based on this is Mr. Spitzer sent these photos home with the commentary and they confirmed whether these were considered sensitive in air quotes or had confidential information, things like that. So we thought that would be an interesting thing to show as well. And I think ultimately, because of the Spitzer collection, we decided to actually put the Flossenburg section across from the Buchenwald section because of the weird little connection we have here between them. So there you have it, folks. That is our temporary exhibit, Through Their Eyes, The Liberation of Concentration Camps. We hope the next time you have a chance to come and see it at the museum. You take a good look, take a look at all the different sections for yourself. And we want you also to walk away understanding that ultimately liberation occurred because the international community did not act soon enough. Um, like with any genocide, inaction by those around them that are not being affected ultimately leads to the continuation of that persecution. So ultimately neutrality in the face of genocide is supporting the oppressors, not the oppressed. So please do keep that in mind when you're taking a look at the temporary exhibit as well as the permanent exhibit. And we look forward to seeing you in the museum again so you can too can learn about how the lessons of the Holocaust uh, 
uh, work against things such as bigotry, hatred, and violence in our community. Thank you and have a great day.